everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Don't Give Up the Ship Podcast, this is episode 84. Uh, and today I'm talking to a post tour CEO on submarines. Uh, awesome dude. Uh, he bent over on the Test Up podcast and uh, I dragged him over here <laughs> to talk about um, leadership development stuff. I had a lot of questions for somebody that had been uh, through a command tour and understood the role, understood the responsibilities, understood all the interactions so that I could ask the types of questions that um, I think a lot of you probably have. Some of it was more people at my level. I, I just had questions about why like leadership did did what it did uh, at that level and why the, some of the decisions happened, why maybe some of the people in those roles are, are different from the person I was talking to because he's definitely... Um, somebody that you'd probably love to have as your CEO and you'll see when we get into the episode. Um, but also just, uh, we, we went through a lot of like leadership stuff that I think will be very pertinent and, and hit home with the listeners. And then also, uh, we're going to do a Q and a series. So stay tuned for that. Um, I'm pretty sure I'm going to call out the CEO suggestion box where he just offered up the, the dialogue between all the listeners and him, uh, where I'm going to post something on discord and Reddit and social media soliciting questions for you to ask this CEO, uh, and kind of get the candid answers that you get from me on a lot of the enlisted leadership development stuff. You can get the types of answers that uh, to questions you might not be comfortable asking your CEO. Uh, you'll get that kind of viewpoint from, from him and you'll get an honest answer. I promise you that. And if, if you don't believe me, listen to the episode and find out and then stay tuned uh, to the end for, uh, I got some discount code stuff for you all for the holidays for D gets apparel and some other fun stuff. So, uh, with that, uh, check out the interview. All right. Hoo-ya. So, um, just like we talked about, if you, we'll start with a quick introduction, give a little bit of your background, uh, as much detail as you would like, and then we'll go from there. Okay. Well, yeah, I'm a, uh, so I have spent my entire career on East Coast uh, 688s, uh, JO on San Francisco, Department Head on Albany, uh, XO on Springfield, uh, CO on Helena. I've done a bunch of uh, front office tours, uh, you know, working for admirals and such like that. And, uh, you know, kind of the, the peak of the career so far was a commanding officer of a 688 here on the East Coast in Norfolk. So. Been uh, been having yeah. a good time here on the fast attack life. Yeah, I dig it. I miss it. I <laughs> doing it. I did my last boat was a BN and a whole new world. Like it was one of those. Like I I always assumed it was going to be so much easier, and how wrong I was. Um, but it's I go a, into it's just like, a different talk. problem set. <laughs> It it is, but it's also like the, it seems like there's so much self inflicted pain. Whereas an eighty eight, it's like like you're probably going more from like fire to fire, or you know what I mean, where you have like all these challenges and the schedule flexes and whatever. But it, it's just like I don't know. I and it's been a hot minute since I've been on an eighty eight, but it uh it seemed more purpose driven most of the time, and like where on a BN, it almost seems like there's just all this white space to fill. So we have to fill it. And why, you know, we don't even own a submarine and we're in an office building and I'm at work at 1900 and we're like, what, why, what is happening? But, uh, anyway, um, so I'm pumped to talk to you about, we talked a little bit before I started recording about, um, I have wanted to ask questions of somebody that has worn a command at sea pin to work number one which i mean that could be anybody that has ever done it but it's particularly because of you know my background as well uh an 1120 submariner like I, it, i've had a lot of questions about a lot of things for a long time where i've just wondered because i've talked to jos about it and it almost feels like they're not fully indoctrinated yet. And also they don't like have the same experiences yet. They haven't gone to shore duty and seen some other part of the Navy and then come back and done a department head tour and then gone and done some more stuff and then come back as an XO, you know? So there's like a ton of experience that they haven't had the opportunity to have yet. Um, and so it's like part of it for me, like, I guess I'll st just start with like leadership related stuff with, with respect to like, what happens in the development of a 
an officer as their like because I know there's a lot of like you go through the nuclear training pipeline and then there's some other schools and then you arrive on a submarine. So like and and then subsequent like operational tours and, and shore tours, so, like what kind of leadership development like education happens throughout that pipeline? Because there's obviously like the initial pipeline and then you have schools that happen throughout development. So I'm just curious, like what kind of interaction they have with like actual like leadership development and education type stuff. Well, I think uh, where it really starts is when from your commissioning source, as they call it. Right. So either you were ROTC or the Academy. Um, right. And then there's the guys from OCS, but uh, they're not really going to get anything. But um, for ROTC, that's the only thing I can really speak of because I was a, an ROTC guy. Um Right. You know, we're, we're, you're getting some leadership stuff. You're kind of, here's some scenarios, but I've always found that a lot of that initial kind of accession leadership, God, it, it, yeah. a lot of times it feels like, okay, you're the, uh, you're the leader, you're the platoon leader of a rifle team going into Vietnam, like type of stuff. <laughs> like, it's okay. Here's me and my yeah. six guys. I'm like, I got it. Um, and so I, in retrospect, it didn't feel super applicable to, Hey, now you're in yeah. charge of, of a division on a submarine. Um, so, but you, right. you get, you get that going through, uh, your, your commissioning source. Um, I imagine the Academy mm. has something very similar, probably more broad. Uh, you get to power yeah. school. There's nothing in power school. You get to prototype. There's nothing okay. in prototype. And in Sobic now, granted, you know, uh, I'm fairly well along. So Sobic um, for me was Could've in changed. a year that yeah. started yeah. with 19, you know? So back <laughs> yeah, then there was, a, there was a, yeah. Right. So there was, there was, there was some stuff there, but again, it seemed very kind of scenario based in what would you do? And very, mm. on one hand, very kind of conversational with, well, let's have a, a discussion amongst the class. What would you do? And what would you do? Um, but right. It, again, it was these weird, broad scenarios that didn't seem truly applicable to what I was going to go deal with. Um, and right. then you get to your boat, and you're like, "Here's your here's your division. You've got, you know, I was the uh, I was the EA. Actually, it was the RCA when I first showed up, the Reactor Controls Assistant. And it's like, hey, here's your ten guys, and um, your chief is this guy, and you've got two guys that have uh, wife problems. One guy's divorced." Uh, two guys are about to have get evicted. This guy's in debt. Like none of that kind of stuff was ever discussed in leadership. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and so you kind of find yourself thrust into the fire, um, right? But you what, get through your. You get do they your, spend any? You're good. Uh, I was just gonna. Do they spend any time, at least, greasing the skids for like, hey, you're gonna be drinking out of this fire hose, but listen to your chief and that's the person that's supposed to be teaching you these things and or the you know obviously there's the other experience of officers on a submarine where as surf ships they probably don't have as much access to like this commanding officer in the xo but like do they, do you get primed to at least be open to and receive from because like in my world we train chiefs to hey it's your job to teach a division officer how to be a leader so do you get primed on your end for any of that along the way Oh, 100%. Like the whole, the whole way, it's like, hey, when you okay. get to your ship, you know, your chief is there to help you. Um, now, some people okay. may or may not have a great chief. Um, and so yeah, you got you to find, find the help where you can go get, where you can find it. But because uh, right. all chiefs aren't created equal, it's like all officers aren't created equal. Um, right. But yeah, we are absolutely, it's like we show up, you know, nice little butter bar ensign still squeaking from the <laughs> necks and, uh, we're, we're told, Hey, your chief's going to help you. So that's what we look for. Okay. Interesting. So the, you were, it sounded like you were going to continue with the pipeline piece of it or were you, did you wrap up with that? Oh yeah. No. Well, well once, once you, uh, you kind of finish your JO tour, but that's a, that's a three year leadership laboratory in and of itself. Um, right. And SOAC, I, you know, the, uh, the advanced course going for department head, I don't recall there being any leadership stuff. Um, really? because that course, at least at the time I went through, they'll even tell you, it's not designed to help you with your department head job. It's designed to help, to help you be the officer of the deck on a fast attack on mission. Okay. And so, I mean, so does that strike you as strange? Like, <laughs> I, it oh, seems it, bizarre it, uh, to me. It's, it, it, 
I, I understand it, but I mean, it's, it struck me as strange. And I, and I've heard that the, they've given a little bit more, uh, towards your specific department head job. But I mean, I, okay. I remember, cause I was a navigator. I remember distinctly having like one of those lectures where they're like, and the navigator will make this decision. And I raised my hand and I'm like, Hey, uh, I'm going to go be a navigator. So when are you going to teach me how to make that decision? Right. And they said, well, that's not what this school's for. <laughs> okay. And so, so I was when, like, well, yeah. that's, I was like, that's, yeah, it's, it's less than fulfilling. Um, but then you realize what the school is for and, uh, yeah. okay. And I, and I understand my understanding now is that they have kind of added a bunch of stuff into that curriculum to okay. kind of help people with those, those kind of decisions. So. Well, that's good. Um, cause I, yeah, I, it, <laughs> it always makes me nervous when I hear responses like that, because it seems like that's the attitude across the board with just about everything is that I got because it, it was um, uh, I'm gonna I'm I'm spacing on his name the one of the test up guys we did a podcast together and I told him that if I was basically king for a day I would and I was forced to get rid of like schools like formal brick and mortar outside of the skin of the submarine schools I would delete everything before I deleted leadership developments at an education type stuff and he's like, whoa, oh, that's a bold statement. <laughs> and I'm like, well, if you think about all of the issues that you have when you're in leadership positions and the fact that I could teach you how to do every single technical thing with a book and the real life piece of equipment and the submarine when it's operating or when we're in port or whatever, even though it is, it's great to have a ship's control trainer where I can do whatever I want and make all the mistakes in the world and there's no real world consequences. Like, it's amazing. But I would contend that the reason why a, a surface ship crashes into a super tanker is le is leadership based when you drill down to it, right? Like where there's stuff that happens where it, it seems like we get really concerned with the symptom of a problem instead of figuring out what the actual problem is. Like why won't, why aren't people that like we, we get in a critique and something's gone horribly wrong and we're like, Hey, you, you, like, that you did this procedural thing wrong or you didn't circle X or you didn't do the tag out procedure right or whatever. And it's like, okay, but why didn't they do it right? Like wh why was the, why does this person who has never had an issue or has very rarely had an issue now having an issue? And then we're like, oh, well, they didn't get any sleep. Okay. Why didn't they get any sleep? Like, you know what I mean? And getting to the place where we're, we find, oh, hey, maybe it, they're not getting sleep because we have a culture where it's okay to rack these guys out whenever they, whenever we want or make them stand too much watch or do some kind of thing that's a stressor that creates an environment where they're not getting enough sleep and then they get racked out to, to do these tags and then they're not focused and they don't care because all they want to do is hurry up and get back in the rack. And so it's like when we don't have anything in place to, to routinely, it seems, to teach people like you were saying how to make those decisions or how to make sure that people are being taken care of in a way that prevents a lot of these problems from ever becoming problems in the first place. It like baffles me that, that the organization doesn't take leadership development and education serious enough to program it into those steps as they happen along the way, because like SOAC might not be for that express purpose, but like e either they add it in, which it sounds like they've added some of it in, or they just add a course on it, add a week on at the end where you f get a bunch of salty old dudes like me in a room to teach you how to make that decision. So like, okay, now you know the decisions you're going to be forced with when you're in the role as department head. So here's how to do that. Like here's, okay, you're confronted with these scenarios and you explain like what happened, how they arrived there and the type of decision you're going to have to make. And then you let them make that decision and then you kind of workshop through, okay, here's all of the tertiary effects that that decision has on all of these real people that you're going to be charged with leading that you didn't think of. And here's what you could do to mitigate those or here's what you could do to avoid those pitfalls or whatever. And it's just like, I don't know, like, because <laughs> it, it's the same on our end, which is why I do this podcast. It's like, they don't, you get to the senior enlisted academy at 16, 18, 20 years. And it's like, that's the first really robust leadership development education you get in a career. And it's like, for a lot of people, it's too late. You know, like the bad behavior <laughs> has already been reinforced. And it's like, 
their brain's already been shut down by because all of their the things that they think they know or that they think are right have been validated by promotions and awards along the way. So by the time they get to SEA, it's like it's they're checking a box, you know, and it's yeah, it sucks because SEA is amazing. I often no, it is. It's a it's a great school, and and the same thing for us on the officer side is your first like no kidding dedicated leadership school is for PXO. Uh, at least for the submarine force, right? Yeah. Um, right. And so, right. and yeah, and and I, I have often, uh, you know, I, I'm sure I can be quoted as saying that who you are, you know, is at least for the submarine force, who you are when you leave your boat as a department head is who you're going to be as a CO. Like yeah. how you lead, how you manage stress, how you manage just an amazing amount of taskers how you delegate, yeah. how you trust people, how you build up people, how you train people, all of that. Where you are and what you believe when you leave your department head tour, that's what you're going to bring to the table as a CO. Because you're going to go to EXO leadership. <sighs> it's not really going to put a dent in what you think because you've been successful yeah. to this point. And right. so on a submarine is so short, you know, it's 18 months nominally, yeah. you're really not going to change much. So when you roll in as CO, that's that's who you were when you left as department head with a few more years, hopefully, of wizened and maybe softened um, experience. Yeah. yeah, and and it seems like if you're going to open up to um, developing further, it's going to be like almost like a gained wisdom from a lot of the pain you go through. Likely, because for us, it's probably from making chief until the like post cob tour <laughs> like it seems like that's when like post cob tour or like the, even like the last year you kind of see them start to soften a little bit and start to like understand if they're going to if not they just you know keep going the trajectory that they're going and hopefully it doesn't turn into a fiery crash but the, <laughs> the if they're going yeah, no, I mean, to that, kind of open I mean, I th- yeah if they're going to open back up it kind of happens towards the end it seems like which it's almost like it's not too late, but it it's too late for that command tour or for the Cobb tour, right? Yeah, it's uh, it's it's too late to have really had a good effect. I would say that it's even then it's it's not opening up. I think the only way you, I don't think you open up. I don't think you open up for input on how to lead. I think mm-hmm. you have to start knowing that you don't know everything. Right. Yeah. That's a better right. way of saying because, it. I, I, that's kind of what I was thinking. Yeah. If, if you don't start, like if you don't come in the gate going, Hey, I'm in charge and I am responsible. And, but, but I don't know everything and I don't understand everything because there's, there's an infinite number of situations, personalities, things that can mm-hmm. happen. Um, if you think, you know, everything right out of the gate, then you're not willing to listen. And then, you right. know, the guys that get to the end and all of a sudden people think they're now willing. It's not that they're willing. It's just that they think that they know everything. And so they're like, they're just, they're entertaining your thought, um, but they're not probably really paying attention. Yeah. Yeah. And so like, and I like the way, cause it, it, when you go into it, it's like, they know they're in charge, but they don't necessarily know that they don't know everything. And that's a lot of the times what I find seems to be the problem is that, they're making it. It's almost like based on the lack of education and up to that point and being open to the experiences, teaching them lessons up to that point, they end up in a place where they almost feel like they're, they got to fake it until they make it. And then when they arrive at a place where they're in that job, they feel like they've made it. And so they think that, Oh, well all that faking it was what I'm supposed to be doing. You know, and it's like, you end up in a in a perilous situation where it's like I can't tell this guy anything, and and you're trying so hard because like the cob I had it with I, I gave you some context on one of my CEOs like the the cob I had I mean I, that dude God bless him tried so hard to ex, like explain what was happening and and why he was wrong or why he was running into the issues that he was or 
or whatever. And th- then it towards the end of his tour, there was a time where he alienated the entire Chiefs quarters. And it's like, I mean, good luck being a CO if you alienate the entire Chiefs quarters. And it was just like, how do you rehab that? Well, you have to come down with your hat in your hand and apologize for what you just did. And it's like, he's, I'm, I'm not doing that. And it can be, God forbid, you you have five seconds of humility. Like it's because what kills me is it's not like we don't know you're in charge still. Like it's just we want to know that you value us, and that's it. And it's like, and if you publicly say that you don't, I mean, what do you think's gonna happen? They're human beings. Like I'm not saying that they should quit or they have some right to do so and check out and whatever. But it's like. You're going to have a real hard time getting the type of support that you need to be successful from that group of human beings. Like I, I would say that I it would expect and demand as like a cob or a CEO that those people continue to do their jobs. And I don't think a lot of those people stopped like taking care of their people. But there was a lot. <laughs> there's a lot of taking care of the CEO that that happens along the way on the chief's end of it that I mean, if you're going to do what what this guy did it was like it was dangerous and i you know like i don't know and we were deployed at the time too so it's just like good grief you know like if some one of those very human beings with all the all the you know faults of of a human being were to do something really stupid and almost set that guy up to fail i mean that could affect a mission that could have cost lives that could damage equipment that could do a whole lot of stuff that you i would imagine no i mean no one ever wants to find themselves in, in that situation. And I don't think it would ever be intentional, but you never know. Like, I mean, people get pissed off and do strange things sometimes. So I don't, I don't know. It, it, I, I struggle with the idea that, that we don't take it seriously. And so exactly what you just described happens. And then you, you end up in a situation where hopefully there's one of the three people in that triad is a more developed leader that that tries to kind of balance it out um it just seems like because like you said all chiefs aren't created equal right like there's a lot of cobs out there that aren't going to be able to handle a, that type of a co either because they're just not going to have the tools or the the like relevant experience and then the xos are you know same thing so you could end up with three people that are all kind of programmed the same way. And that's when I feel like we'd probably get into pretty negative command cultures. I mean, uh, you you, you said a whole lot there. I've got so many. Yeah. Sorry. Um, (laughs) No, it's, it's fine. It's, uh, it's good. It's good when people go on an emotional tear. Uh, it tells you that they care. Um, it's, it's interesting, right? It's, I have personally always approached every job as, I am here to take care of people. Um, yeah. You know, it's like the, the, the larger Navy is a, it's a huge organization. It moves slowly. It changes slowly. So what can I do where I'm at to make life better for my people? Uh, Cause right. you can't fix it for everybody, but if you can fix it for the people within your scope, right. then you're probably doing good yep. things. Um, and, and, I approached my CO tour as, you know, as this is the end of the line. Like this is the goal, right? Um, I am here. I've made it to command at sea and this was the goal. So what, what I am here to do is not to, you know, take three years to pat myself on the back and say, congratulations for being a master of the universe. I'm here (laughs) because I am the most experienced person as far as the Navy goes on the ship. Mm -hmm. Um, I was, you know, until I had one chief that showed up, that was, that was like a month older than me. I was the oldest person on the ship. Um, yeah. You know? And so it's, it's one of those like, Hey, look, I'm here to teach you what I know so that you can be successful so that hopefully one day you can be better than me. Right. So where does that come from? That's that's the way you should approach it. Yeah, no, I agree. Where do you, why are, why do you think about it that way? Because I I was literally just talking to somebody about this today about how, like, like, why are you self-aware enough to understand that that's your role and that's how you should approach it? And and I'm not like, I think everybody should generally approach it that way, but there could be some variance. But why, why were you so aware going in that this is who you needed to be? And I would contend that like, 
it's correct. So like, like what, what's different with you versus a lot of these other COs that, that I've experienced and I'm sure you've seen some of them as well. And, and really it's not even COs, it's just leaders that are, are in that type of a senior position. I, well, I think there's a couple things for me personally. Um, I've, I've just always been that way. I'm a very personable kind of person. I'm not an engineer. Like I don't have a technical degree from college. And so, okay. um, I, I've got a, I, you know, I have a fine arts degree. I have a music degree. So, oh, um, really? So okay. I just think about the world. Yeah. I, I think about the world differently. And so, and I think about interpersonal relationships and I'm fascinated by human interaction and, and how one person can say one thing and it makes another person feel another way. And so, but it all kind of stems from, I think my JO tour where I, um, you know, I was refueling, uh, San Francisco. So I had like two years in the yard and then I had a CO and I had one CEO that was great. And the next CEO was just different. And you saw the command climate changing and you saw how it was affecting the mm-hmm. guys. And so, you know, my original goal was to, I was going to get out after five years, pay back my RTC scholarship and go be a band director. Um, and I decided to stay in. And for my department head tour, um, I kind of, I kind of, I, I approached it with the, what I just said, which was like, okay, I can't fix everything. Right. But you know, I remember, I remember my, my guys when I was a divo and how frustrated they were. So maybe as a department head where department head is really the first time you have really palpable power on a submarine yeah. to affect right. what's going on. And so I said, Hey, can I at least make it, if nothing else, can I at least make it a place where people don't wake up in the morning and go, Oh, geez, I got to go to the boat. Right. Like, can I at least yep. make it not a miserable place? And, uh, right. and I felt like I did that. And so I decided to kind of keep trying to go for that for CO. So I, I wish yeah. I could tell you, uh, a really clear answer on this is why I think the way I think it's just always been inherently obvious to me that the role of a leader is to make the people around them better. Right. And that's that's yeah, really the end I, I of think, it. I mean, you could you could talk about yeah. what's the mission, what are we trying to do? Can we get a muck? None of that stuff matters. I every single right. guy that checked on the boat, I told them, "Hey, I'm trying to build great people, right? If I if I help you be the best person you can be, you're going to be a great sailor, and that's going to make my ship better. So I'm going to get like the third level benefit of making you into the best person you can be." And I've just right. always thought it thought of it that way yeah but the also so by you doing it that way all of the stuff that you mentioned just happens like it's just like a a side effect of you taking care of people because like the the mission doesn't change whether you're mission focused like and, and it's all about like tactics and technical aptitude and all that stuff instead of making sure people are taken care of. Because if you meet all these people's needs and you make sure you're developing them into good people, turns out they're going to show up to work, ready to work, and they're going to do a really great job while they're there. And you're going to find yourself with all the accolades and all the spreadsheets are green and all the, you know, like all of the people centeredness metrics are met and and retention's high and you're winning all the awards and the Commodore's coming down and saying holy crap like you guys are doing it right so that's what I, that's what, what blows my mind is it's just like if people would just approach it that way if they would just understand that like the people are the mission like for leadership like if you're wearing khakis to work people are the mission like i don't I, the day and, and unless i was standing dive the the my role completely changed once I started wearing khakis where it was like I'm not doing the mission anymore I'm making sure the people that are doing the mission have everything that they possibly need to succeed and that's it that's my whole job like is to make sure that they're trained and educated and rested and all their needs are met and all the crap they need on the submarine and like come coach them through the process and and oversee them and all that all that stuff like there's a million different ways to put it but it's it, it, and it seems like more often than not, what happens is they get f- everybody gets focused on 
the the second and third order effects they're like well i we need to get the battle e or we need to do a, a, an excellent on horse or we need to whatever and it's like if you take care of these people they will do that for you like i'm telling you if you just do what you did like these people are gonna do like like they're gonna want to do those things for you they're gonna be like yeah well, well like we want this co to walk away with a, an excellent or score it's so it's like and does it always happen i'm sure it doesn't always happen but you know what i mean like because you still there's other things that go into that but it's if you approach it that way all of those things just come like they just people like i tell that to junior sailors that are focused on advancement and it's like just study your job and be as good as you can at your job and just pursue that excellence for the sake of being good at your job and that all the positive stuff you want will just come like you'll sit down and take an advancement exam and it's going to just happen naturally because you've been studying everything you need to, to be good at your job. Cause that's all an advancement exam is like, it's, you need uh, to. Yeah. It's all, it's all any of the exams are. It's uh, I, right. I tell so many people, I'm like, look, if you are doing the right stuff, right. Cause in, in the life cycle of the ship, what matters is going out and doing the mission and succeeding at the mission. And, you know, right. the, either it's a fast attack going through their workup cycle, you know, it's your, your Guam boats in their little Guam cycle, if you're, it's your BNs on their PDTP. It's about, are you ready when it's all done to go do the gig? Mm. And if you're doing yeah. all of the right stuff, whenever what exam comes up, advancement exam, ORS, CRE, SMI, whatever, yep. if you're doing stuff yeah. the right way, those are just checks in the box to go, yeah, you're on the right track. Keep doing what you're doing. Right. If you're focusing on 100%. those checks, then you're not focusing on the real goal. Right. Right. And that's I used to tell the the SMI guys, like they they'd randomly come up and be like, ah, we might do an SMI, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, you can do an SMI right now. Stop by any time. Like the open sign is always on. Call me in at 20 hundred. We'll do an SMI. I'm like, I guarantee I'll pass. Like, yeah, I mean, if you can give me three days heads up so I can clean, de like do, just make sure everything's clean or whatever, roll out the red carpet. But I was like, I'll pass an SMI on a Tuesday, man. It's fine because we're we play how we practice. Like it's it's it doesn't matter. We're always doing it this way. We're not all of a sudden changing how we do things because an inspection team's coming down in two months. I'm not gonna like retrain and and like re repackage everything and tell them, oh hey, today we're gonna be on our best behavior. But as soon as they leave, we're gonna go back to what we normally do because one, the inspection team will be able to tell, it, and two, it, exactly, it's like, it just doesn't lead to success. It's not why we do it. We just do it right all the time. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, it's uh, no, no one gets smarter overnight, you know. So right, just right. We we do what we do. Right. Um. So I'm curious. So like we talked a little bit already about both sides of how, like based on the the development of and education that happens or doesn't happen. So you end up with like some some chiefs and some officers that aren't you know they're not created equal right like they're just there's people that and like what i talk about a lot on this podcast is how much of that is just like a lack of of maturity or level of knowledge or experience or whatever along the way where these people are thrust in these positions and in my opinion the organization doesn't do a great job preparing them for that position so same thing happens when you don't properly train and qualify a watch standard and then qualify them and put them on watch it's they're going to have issues so um, what have you seen along the way that you that has kind of been and it, it could just be like a C story if that's easier. But like, what have you seen along the way that's been kind of like a, a, a trend or like a theme as far as issues between um, I'll just say enlisted leadership and, and like the wardroom like that you think that could be better or that like what are the things that you commonly see that kind of where we run into issues with communication or trust or whatever? Um, you know, for, for between the wardroom and the, uh, and the, and just, you know, both the goat locker and just the enlisted in general. Um, mm -hmm. If there, if there's, if there is a trend um, that I, I always tried to head off at the pass, it's this idea that, um, you have to be infallible <laughs> and that you have to be seen as in charge. You know, I, yeah. uh, 
every every new ensign that checked on board my boat, I was I always gra- I sat down with them. I said, "Look, everybody knows that you don't know anything." Yeah, and it's okay, right? right. No one expects you to know any everything on day one. Right. What they expect you to do is care. Yeah. So as long as you care, they will help you get the knowledge that you need. Where I see people that have problems is, you know, you get that random JO that shows up and uh, and they believe all those leadership stories of I'm the right I'm the leader of the rifle platoon and so what I'm in charge <laughs> and you will follow me. And it's like, hey man, I, I need you to understand that you're gonna go in the engine room first. And these are some really, really sharp individuals. Right. And some of them have college degrees. And let's be honest, a flip of the coin, you're in their seat and they're in yours. Right. So you are no better just because you're wearing khaki. Yeah. Um, and so you, but you get some people that think, and it's not that they think that they're better. It's that they think they have to assert that they're in charge. Right. And it's like, look, we all know you're the guy responsible. But if you're going to act this way, you're not going to get the backup and the assistance that you need to yep. learn. Yep. So yeah. That, that's always been the uh, the biggest issue that I've seen. The same thing happens to chiefs that do that. Like the the their division doesn't get like back them up and support them in the way that they should when they completely alienate them by acting like they know everything or acting like they're better than because. We've created, we've, I think chiefs as a, like, as an organization, like the, the collective mess has done an amazing jobs of shooting ourselves in our foot, uh, with this, the image of ask the chief or like, uh, results not excuses and like all the stuff that you see on shirts and stickers and whatever, where it's, they've, we've almost created this, like, um, unattainable standard that is also like intentionally vague because it wasn't really meant to be a standard. It was just people kind of creating this. um, I don't know, like a, like if you read the CPO creed, there's a lot of stuff in there that sounds very like, uh, um, like I'm tooting my own horn, basically. Like I'm just, uh, it's like self congratulatory, like, crap about how we're special and we're better than especially when compared to other services and like e7s like we're the only ones that do this and all this other crap which i just feel like there's a lot of goodness in there too but there's a bunch of stuff where we've laid the foundation of that of love like living up to this unattainable standard and and also it, it kind of sets you up for that exact trap that you just described of like, well, now I'm a chief. So now I have to be the fountain of wisdom and like (laughs) be the, I have to have the answer all the time. And I have to like live up to this, this concept um, as described in the creed and everything else. And what's bizarre to me is that the creed in and of itself doesn't do a great job of, really telling you like this is who you who we are and this is what we do like it's it's kind of strange like and i've talked to a retired fleet mass chief about like we don't even really know where it came from <laughs> like it sounds like somebody <laughs> wrote a pretty strong pinning script and somebody was somebody else is like ah that sounded really great we should just use that um because it's evolved tell, tell me why it's awesome to be a chief <laughs> yeah yeah it's also evolved over time um, it used to say some other stuff that was even less, um, I don't know, less focused and less desirable uh, for like what I would want out of a leader. But and then when you conversely, when you look at the mission, vision and guiding principles, which coincidentally are what we're evaluated on as chiefs, that is a lot different and a lot more focused on what I think we should be doing and how we should like, this is who we are and this is what we do. Um, but yeah, I think that it just by our like by our own hand like we set ourselves up for new chiefs to fall into the same trap over and over and over again of they feel like they have to like fake this role that they've seen from the outside looking in almost this like caricature of a of an enlisted leader that we've created like ourselves we've done this to ourselves um 
And then I find that like a lot of my time has been spent trying to undo that idea is like, no, this is not a thing. Like you don't have to be infallible. You don't have to know everything all the time. You're allowed to have human moments. You're allowed to say, I don't know. Let me go find out. You're allowed to go ask for help and you're allowed to do that publicly. Like you don't have to hide that behind the door of the chief's mess. And so it's, you find yourself in trouble a lot of the time by, uh, by trying to do that. And it, it, yeah, I, it's such a, a sim- it's a, it's, it's, it's interesting, right? Cause mm-hmm. you, you look at things like creeds, they're important, right? Cause right. you need, people need, need ideals to work towards. Right. But I think sometimes we lose the idea that it's an ideal that yeah. is, you know, like perfection is that, right. And it's that's what we're striving to be. Not a standard. And so, and we're not, and yeah, and we're not there right. and you're not going to be there because that's almost impossible to achieve and it's okay to fall short occasionally and to, and, but as long as that's what you hold in your mind as the goal of, I would like to be this person. Okay, great. Yeah. You want to be the infallible guy who always knows everything. What are you doing to be that person? Because it's, you better be doing more than putting on a khaki shirt in the morning. Right. You better be studying. Yeah. You better be working. You better be actively trying to improve yourself and your level of knowledge as well as your people. Right. If you're not doing that, then you're just looking, you're throwing the creed up on the wall and saying, I've made it. Yep. And, and that's <laughs> one of the things, that's one of the things that is always, I don't, I don't remember who said it. Uh, I think it was one of the admirals that I worked for. Mm. Um, and he, when he said it, I was like, God, this is so true. Is that you get awards for what you've done. You get promoted because of what the Navy thinks you can do. Right. 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 And to me, that implies that you may not be ready for the next gig, but mm. the Navy thinks that you can get into that job and learn and continue to bring what you bring to the table in your current position and learn and grow and make it. Right. And make something special of it. So if you think that just because you got promoted that that was it, then you're probably doing yourself a disservice in your own personal growth uh, by by stagnating and saying, well, that was it. Good for me. Right. Right. And I, I thought I a thousand percent agree. And it's like it, what's funny about that idea is that it always loops me back around to. Yeah. Like, no, you are right. So what are we doing about it? Because I can tell you, I've I've only been in one chief's mess and it was on the special boat with a guy that was a, a third tour cob, a Frank Lister award winning, just monster. And the a very, very senior chief's quarters that we like we spent time talking about leadership and and going over like heritage was really important to him like we would do chiefs training we would do cobs training um and during the chief season the, it was incredible and i i talk a lot about the, like the reason why i feel like i developed into what i think is a pretty good chief is that i just happened to make it in that space where it was like chief university i just had i couldn't get away with it anything like there was a senior chief or a, literally a senior chief or a master chief around every corner so like every single time i tried to do something stupid there was somebody there to smack me around and tell me like get back inside the lines boot like this is not what we're doing and uh they pull yeah. me in the chief's mess and just be like what are you doing and i'd try to explain myself and they would commence training so and i don't think that's common at all like i actually on the last podcast episode i recorded um I was explaining to this chief that it, it, I had a meeting, not a meeting. I had dinner with a couple of buddies. It was my EDMC and my doc from, uh, the special boat as I was, I'm now a senior chief going back to my last submarine. And, uh, they, I was out in Hawaii for something. I can't visiting friends or something and, um, had dinner with the two of them. And they just like, we wanted to have you have dinner with you because we love you, but also because we need to prepare you for what's about to happen. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And they're like, dude, I can already guess. Yeah, you're not going to a normal submarine. Like, you're you're not going. You are going to a normal submarine, and it's you did not grow up in a normal chief's mess. So, like, stand by to be frustrated and shocked, and you know, like, they just wanted to prep me for the concept that on used to fish, I had a bunch of Type A personalities with a ton of experience that all volunteered to be there. So there was a couple of knuckleheads, but mo- most of the people there uh, were were amazing at what they do and probably would be, you know, number one EP 
chiefs or, or senior chiefs or whatever on any other submarine in the fleet. He's like, you're going to a normal submarine. And furthermore, you're going to a BN. <laughs> so he's like, you're going to go and there's going to be maybe one other person like you. And then there's going to be some guys that are like, you know, pretty okay. And then there's going to be a bunch of chuckleheads that you're going to want to kill. And I'm like, okay. And then they start explaining to me, like, not that, not that they're bad people, but they're going to be in low power mode until you give them a reason not to be. I was like, okay. And so it was a super productive meeting because then I went in with the understanding that I was going to encounter a lot more resistance than I'm used to. And he, they were not wrong. Like they were, <laughs> they were, I was all by myself at first. And then, um, we got a really good EDMC and then, uh, the cob that we had at the time kind of got like told to go home. Like it, what he didn't get fired, but he kind of did. And then got a new cob in who, and then another department chief. And that it was just like, you know, the deck stacked and we here stand by for cultural change. But, but yeah, it was, uh, it was interesting to say the least. <laughs> like I kind of, I'm not well, going it, it to, it, good. But it's a, it's a, it's, it's, it's an interesting discussion of motivation, right? Yeah. Um, I've always found that people rise to the expectation you put on them, right? You go, you go to mm-hmm. the special boat. Here's a bunch of, like you said, you know, cat, you know, and, and it's capital bold font type, you know, so that's 23 point font bold type <laughs> A people. Yep. So, so they're all self-motivated. Right. And then you you go to you know a, a unit that's not a special mission unit. They're all still great people, right? right? Everyone wants to work. Everyone wants to feel like what they do matters yep. and that they're appreciated. And so, you know, you get to you get to a a ship where that's not happening. And that's where I I always see um, that sluggishness towards innovation and people taking initiative. And it's not because they're bad people and it's not because they're not capable. It's because they feel like it doesn't matter if they did it anyway. Right. And so, you know, you get just getting a couple people into the upper levels that say, Hey man, I see you and I know you're working your tail off and I appreciate it puts them through the roof. And then all of a sudden they're, they're wanting to do better because they recognize that they, that people see me and they know, and I matter. And so yep. that's always been my experience with the difference between um, really, really high functioning boats, even Her Majesty's ship <laughs> and, uh, and the lowers. It's not the quality of the people that are on there. Right. It's, it's the attitude towards do you matter and why do you matter? And are they appreciated for the fact that they sign on the dotted line just like anybody else? Right. And they're out here trying to do the best they can and – please just tell me that it matters that I'm out here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think that loops back into the, like just understanding the needs of people, like uh, the leadership. I f- often, I find that it's like, they're worried about like sked being up to date and, and their spreadsheets, CTQS being green. And like, they just want to check all the boxes and go home. And they, they lose sight of the making sure that the people feel valued piece, which if they started with that, like we talked about earlier, then all of this stuff would just kind of fall into place. And, um, I talk a lot about, uh, this kid that was one of my plainsmen. It was my second patrol as the dive where like the first one, they stacked my watch section because I was like uncomfortable, (laughs) like still learning, you know, like it's my first time being the dive. I'd never sat sticks. So there's a lot bigger, probably steeper learning curve for me than most, but got pretty good at it. And so the next patrol, they just kind of threw me in the rotation and, I had this st- plainsman that very experienced torpedo man, but he was the guy like he, he had gotten in trouble for some kind of integrity issue on his last boat and got bounced to us. And, um, everybody, he, he was a kind of guy. He was like pig pen from uh peanuts cartoons. Like he was this kid yeah. he's from the South. He was like always outside grooming standards. Looks like he slept in his uniform. Like, not the most professional guy in the world with what he came out of his mouth or his behavior or anything. And, uh, he was in my watch section and he was the kind of guy that would like, he'd, he'd fall asleep driving and just stuff like that, that you'd kind of, everybody hated having this kid in their section. So they put this kid in my section with a, a brand new guy that was, he just got qualified 
And so he didn't, you know, not a lot of experience. So this, this kid is the, this torpedo man is my most experienced ship driver. And for me, like, I'm a guy that like, I don't have as much experience as this torpedo man either, as far as sitting up here, driving the ship in any capacity. So I, I just had a conversation with him after a few watches where he was, you know, he's pissing me off. He's falling asleep. And he's doing all this, all these types of things, just like not paying attention or like needing a head call too often because he just didn't want to be up there. And uh, I had a conversation. I'm like, look, man, like when we're taking this thing to PD, like I need you. Like I'm relying on you and your experience and your expertise to get us up there safely. And I'm like, I need you to talk to the new guy. Like he needs your help, too, because like he's never he's only done this a handful of times. And a lot of that was in the trainer. So like you're it, man. Like we need you to be dialed in. Like I'm counting on you to really like do a good job of mentoring this kid. You guys need to be communicating as we're driving and then tell me what you need and be honest about it. And then like, we're going to succeed and, and you'll see, and you saw his kind of eyes light up. And then first PD trip after that conversation, he parked it and it was just like, yes, you know, like, and from then on he was, he would drive that thing. Like he stole it. And it, everybody was like, gee, what did you do with, with this kid? And I was just like, look, man, I just treated him like he, he was valuable. Like I just talked to him like he, yeah. he added value to what we were doing up there because he does. Turns out he has the potential to do what you're watching him do now. And they couldn't believe it. And I'm like, it's, it's all it takes is you like letting people know that they have value like that. The end, that's the secret sauce. No, absolutely, man. I mean, every every single person, I, I my my check in interviews are probably way too long, but uh, <laughs> you know, like I always told people, I'm like, every single, I, I don't care who you are. I'm here. I'm the captain. I've been in the Navy at that point, like what, 19 years, yeah. and this is my fifth 688. So I'm theoretically pretty salty, right? And I was like, and I walked on board, going, look, every single person on this boat know something about this boat that I don't know. Right. Right. Like right. every single person has something that they can help me learn and make me better. And if you don't, if you don't approach people that way, um, then you're just dismissing their, their life experience and who they are as a person. Uh, and you're really just not taking every opportunity to learn from people and to help them learn so that we all grow. Right. And even like, even if theoretically you did know everything, it's like you still can't do everything like you need these people Absolutely. to be good at their jobs. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Um, yeah it's the only way I'm going to sleep at night is by trusting everybody to do their job the best they can. Yeah, 100%. Um, kind of, I'm going to veer off this direct like reports style like stuff like the it's stuff in the inside the skin of the submarine like. You said you've you've been on Flagstaff, so I'm on a Flagstaff right now, and I'm starting to. I, I'm getting a little bit of, um, I guess just like some idea of how that that level of leadership in in the Navy thinks and operates. Um, and I've been surprised by two things: one, that it doesn't seem like people ever really plan as far in advance or as proactively as it feels like would be the like ideal. Um, but also like there's this detachment that it just seems like the more layers of, of separation there are between you and a submarine, then you kind of like lose sight of what's actually happening on the submarine. And I, I could give you an example if, if needed, but like, I guess just what do you see as you, as you start to be, um, like kind of layers removed and, and your experience, the type of type of leadership that's, I mean, they haven't like by the time you're at a, at a flag level, I mean, it's probably been almost a decade, I would imagine since they've commanded a submarine. And even when you're commanding a submarine, it's like you're a little bit removed from like the, the daily grind. So like, what do you, what kind of things do you see at that level, I guess I'm, I'm really just at like a general awareness of, cause I've only seen it from the outside looking in, you know, like I've sat in a few meetings and uh, stuff like that, but I don't, I don't get to be like, I'm not the CMC, so I don't get to like see almost everything and, and watch how those guys do business. So like, what do you see at that level that might, I don't know, like, 
I guess just that we don't. I don't even have a specific question. I'm just I'm curious. I'm curious how they think like and and if you see that there's a, a sense of detachment or is it is maybe I'm misinterpreting it or or what? Because I know like generally if I were, were to pull a lot of junior enlisted, they would say that most flag officers have no idea what's going on in the real Navy. And I'm like, is that true? Or is that overstated? Like, what do you kind of see from from where you've sat? I think it's a, I mean, I've 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 sat in the front office, and I've uh, I've sat in the I've sat in the funnel between the waterfront and the front office. Right. Um, it, it's interesting, right? Because there's a couple things in there. One is when when they're making decisions. That's why, as I've often said, every officer's got a chief, right? Right. Even the CO, the CO's got a cob. The uh, the fleet, the fleet admiral's got a CMC. It's true. Uh, you know the TICOM, He's got he's got a TICOM CMC, and and that's the guy that's there to say, hey, sir, here's the decision that you're making. Yeah. Here's how the waterfront is going to have to make that happen. Right. Um. So w- there's things in place to make sure that we or to hopefully make sure that we don't lose sight of here's what it's going to take to make that happen. Yeah. Um, so, so there's that side of it. I often see, and it's been very frustrating having been the guy that would have to get the email and go in and talk to the Admiral. A lot of times, you know, and this is just Jason's personal experience. Um, well, you see that people don't want to go ask the admiral, right? And so you'll see the the staff, and it's not even the front office staff; it's the 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 larger organization staff will, you know, come up with questions or slow roll or well, we can't go tell the boss that. Yeah, and you're like the boss wants to know that the boss needs to know that. Yeah, um, I, I've seen fleet exercises where they're doing things. And at the waterfront level, they're like, hey, I can't achieve that. And they're like, well, you have to achieve that or we're going to have to go tell the boss. Right. I'm like, no, the boss wants to know that we can't even do this for an exercise. Because <laughs> if it was real, we wouldn't be able to do it. Right. Like, don't don't make me do a workaround so that you don't have to tell your boss something. I'm guaranteeing you that's what he wants to know. He's doing this to find the gaps. Yeah. And so trying to obfuscate the gaps so that there's nothing red on a slide is not the goal. Right. And yeah. so you, you see, you see this thing in staff work where people try to make sure that, you know, the Admiral's happy. Yeah. The Admiral's always happy, right? <laughs> Cause he's happiest when we're getting better and, right. and we're making the nation more safe. And, you know, sometimes staff people, sometimes inadvertently, um, cause they're trying to do the right thing, but, they they end up kind of trying to press things down on the waterfront that in in my personal opinion is not what the goal of the uh the particular evolution was yeah i wonder if some of that perception comes from what you just described like the the staff is is for try to force somebody through the eye of a of a needle when all they re- what they really need to be doing is turning turning that around and going to the boss and saying hey like this is here's the problem. Here's why it's a problem, and and like we're working to solve it or whatever. But like instead of instead of turning like in town on the water, no, you have to do this. This is what the admiral wants. It's like no, what the admiral wants is to see if we can do this, and if we can't do this, okay, where do we go from here? You know, and it's like I, I wonder if some of that is like they're the admiral's just taking the blame because the staff is saying no, the admiral wants this, and it's like really, if you told the admiral what, what the waterfront was saying then, you know, like we'd have a different conversation. No, absolutely. It's a, it's, it's one of those things where God bless the waterfront. We always uh, assign blame to the guy that's in charge. Yeah. Um, Even though he may not have any idea of why it's happening. Right. So we go, yeah, he has no clue what's going on down here. Well, he thinks he does because he's asking for reports. It's what's being reported to him. Right. You know, and it's one of those things where no one ever wants to look bad. And so, it becomes a telephone game of what's truly going on down there. And so that's why, you know, the, the folks that are on the personal staff are it, tremendous people because they interview and it's about, Hey, who can help me from being the emperor without clothes? Right. And so that's why they're there. And so, but 
when you get to these super, super large organizations, well, not everybody's that person. And so it, yeah. it starts to become difficult. I wonder like what the, I get what the solution could be because I've seen from, from the end user end of it on a boat where a CEO is concerned about how they look to the Admiral as well. So like even, even the staff might not be getting the information because that CO is concerned about, well, what's next for me? And like the Admiral is going to matter in that where it's like, I'm being evaluated by this, this person too. So it's almost like it, it, the, the idea that the Admiral wants to know would, is it, it like how, once he finds out his reaction and how that affects the person doing the telling is entirely dependent on that Admiral. Like, cause I've had, I've worked for one that, is it was incredible and it was I, like how anybody would ever think that that man didn't have their best interests at heart like I, I don't know i don't know what planet they're living on but then you know like i've worked for another that I, i'm not sure how he, you know like if he's gonna if somebody's kind of career is gonna suffer because they weren't able to thread the eye of that needle so like i you know i i wonder if it if there's a way to almost like separate the the two things where it's like the flow of information would increase dramatically if there weren't really repercussions or perceived possibility of from that person that's also like their reporting senior you know and i mean i guess this commodore comes first in that in that process but they understand it to mean like if i piss off the admiral then like that's gonna roll downhill you know what i mean I think it's, I think that is a problem as old as time. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That, that's, that is not, that's not Navy unique. That is just, Hey, um, am I willing to go to my boss and just say, Hey, look, this is going to make you mad, but I can't. And here's why I can't. Right. Um, and especially, and especially in the Navy, we are very much can do people. Right. Um, but in general, most people don't want to tell their boss that they can't achieve what the boss has told them to do. Yeah. Even with, even though sometimes the boss is asking you to do something that's impossible. Right. Just to see if you can or, or what it would take to actually do it. It's, you know, we do all these exercises and stuff to find gaps because that's what that's what drives funding decisions yeah. hey we tried to do this thing and the waterfront couldn't go to x level force protection because of this that means we need more people we need more funding we need more of this mm. but if every time we try to do something the fleet just quote unquote makes it happen then it never gets better even though the guys down the waterfront are like this is miserable yep. important report yep. just to make this work yeah yeah yeah, the doing doing more with less concept, like we're just going to like grit through it. But then, yeah, you end up with because like even little things I talk a lot about with the waterfront guys about like, look, you you finding a way to fix it as as expeditiously as possible so you can move on with life. As long as you're doing it all safely and in accordance with, uh, you know, nothing's going to go horribly wrong. Like I, I'm OK with that. But also you have to let people know there's a problem. Because otherwise, there's no demand signal for fixing the problem permanently at like an institutional level. Like we have just programs where, um, like the the program we use to like track inventory and order food and everything on the boat. It's like if if there's a problem with that program, you getting in contact with the technical rep and and getting a script to give to the ITs so that they can fix it. Like that's great. But you also have to submit the trouble tickets so that like when the TICOM guys are having a conversation with the person that has that contract saying, or the company that has a contract and saying, hey, your program doesn't work. And they're like, well, we don't have any trouble tickets. So apparently it's working great. You know what I mean? And then like there's no demand signal no, it, at exactly. that level for, for actual change to happen and the funding like you were talking about and everything else. Exactly. Like everything, everything is, it's the whole world, right? Everything is data driven. Right. Okay. You think this is what's going on. Show me why you think that way. Yeah. Well, I just, I know that it's that way. Well, where's the data that backs it up? Yep. And that's why you, those things are so important. Yeah. Yeah. I, t I tell people all the time, like, so we report, you know, endurance levels. And so you'll be sitting at an ops brief on a submarine and some PowerPoint slide will say we have 67 days of food. And then the next day it'll say we have 66 days of food. And then the next day it'll say we have 65 days of food. I'm like, okay, show me how you're getting this number. And they can't because they're making it up. 
Oh, because, well, we've been gone for yeah. however many days. And it's like, no, that's not real. I'm like, you need to put in, in front of an 1120, like, data like you need to have an, a calculated average daily usage times the number of days we have left on on deployment equals the number of days you have remaining for all these line items like you need to be able to show them because when your co comes to you and says hey we're getting extended two weeks chief we gonna be good on food like i'm not i wouldn't accept yeah no we're fine sir like no like show me i want i want you to show me data I want a warm fuzzy so that when that CO clicks send on an email to the Commodore saying, yep, we're all good. We got plenty of food on board. We don't need anything that that's actually true. Like, cause he's, they're going to find out right. if it's not because they, uh, oh yeah, no, I got 28 days of food. Oh, okay. So when something else goes wrong and the other boat schedule gets delayed, we'll just keep you out longer because you have 28 days of food. When in reality you don't. Exactly. And, like, yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. Tell me why you think it's 28 days of food. How, right. what are you going to serve for 28 days that right. makes it 28 days of food? Show me. Yep. And so I, I hand, I hand out this endurance tracker. I'm like, if you put this in front of your CO and it's accurate, they're going to be like, okay, Roger that. Like, I mean, they could send this off the boat and show them like, Hey, this is what we have. Um, but if you just, it's, yeah. it's Oh yeah. No. Cause that's just what we have left. Like, no, that's not going to work. Um, I, I'm trying to think like there was another question I was going to ask and I'm like drawing a blank. It's so I have some stuff that's like how, and this is kind of, this is probably a little niche for most listeners, but like, I've always wondered, so as far as like the supply community goes, how is that perceived by leadership at a high level? Because I've always gotten this feeling, and it's probably because I'm a supply guy, that it's not taken very seriously until something's on fire. Like somebody doesn't have some super important part, and then they got to pull in and or do a BSP or whatever to get it. And then the question is asked, well, why didn't you have this already? But a lot of times it feels like until there's a giant problem, no one's really, no one really cares. And the example that, um, that I would give is, I mean, there's been boats that we failed on an SMI and then they just go to sea anyway. And we're on deployment. And it's like, I understand like, you know, national security and stuff, but it's like, if you fail an horse, you're not going anywhere until you fix that. Right. Like, so, or if you fail like a cert process, you're not going anywhere until you fix that. So if you can't, it, like if I, cause I've sat at out briefs where we've said to a commanding officer, like, I can't tell you if you went to sea today, you could do the mission. Like, I can't tell you, you would have the endurance with subsistence. I can't tell you that you would have the ability to fix the boat if it broke because of all these processes being on fire and like all the inventory validity is being garbage and I can't communicate your endurance to you because it's, I, I'm unable to evaluate it because nothing's getting done correctly. And then the boat goes on deployment anyway. And so it's, we've always kind of uh, talked about this within our, our community is like, Hey, like why, why is this not taken as seriously? Because like I'm a history nerd and, every major conflict in human history has been decided by logistics in my opinion. <laughs> so just like if, it, you know, if Napoleon can't supply his army, the end, like if, if, if we can't fix our submarines and maintain the, like one of the few limiters that we have at sea on nuclear ships, which is food, that's a problem. Like that's going to pull the ship in. That's going to like compromise our ability to complete the mission. But then it's not taken seriously until something is on fire. Like, and I've heard stories from guys where like boats have run out of food on deployment and they were rationing food and all this crazy stuff. And it still doesn't seem to be like, like if that happens, like one of my old cobs told us on, on one of his boats, they were like, people were losing like large amounts of weight because they had to keep the boat out, but they didn't have enough food. And so they started rationing food. I'm like, that's insane. Like, and still it doesn't seem like it, there's a big enough, um, like demand signal from higher up to to take it seriously on the level that it should be, and I always wondered why that was, or if that is accurate. I guess because I it just feels accurate to me. It's um, I mean, you know, on on the boat, it's always uh, God bless the chop, right? He's <laughs> uh, he's he, he's if you're if you're if you're lucky. I mean, when I was a jo most of the chops were 
at least prior enlisted, if not a uh, second tour kind of guy. Well, now you're getting, yeah. you know, ensigns at a, at a supply school that this is their first tour. Right. Uh, and they're sharp individuals, but man, that that is a lot of weight. I mean, you yep. go on a carrier and that person would be in charge of one wardroom. Yeah. And yeah. now they're in charge of, they're in charge of food service, repair parts and everything. So a, I say that to say, God bless the chop. Now that said, um, he's, he's like the one, he or she is the one officer that really has no backup, right? There's a, yeah. you can sit there and be a JO. Well, the, one of those department heads was in your spot mm-hmm. and then the CRX also did your job. And same thing for the department head. Yeah. So there's somebody that can back you up. The chop is there and we're like, oh man, I don't, thanks for the ISMR. Yeah. I really don't know what it says. <laughs> um, and so there's, there's this opportunity where if the chop is awesome, they're communicating and things are great. And if they're not awesome, they can drown and no one will know. Right. Until it's too late. Yeah. And so uh, I'll, I'll tell you that there is a lot of, emphasis placed you know in that pco pipeline mm-hmm. of we have like a whole day sit down and here's like here's here's you know the tycom you know n41 going all right hey here's what you need to look at here's what the ismer should say look for these things you need to do these things yeah and, and really it's about it's about being inquisitive right because you're right uh history would tell you that amateurs talk tactics winners talk logistics mm-hmm. Right. Professionals are about logistics because I can only do at the end of the day, we're going to run out of food. We're going to run out of parts and I can't fight yep. if I can't feed. Yep. So, um, and, and, you know, in being in command and recognizing that, Hey, I don't really know what chop does. Right. Um, and chops chops job is not hard at the end of the day. Right. It's, constant inventories, constantly keeping track, right. constantly estimating. It's just that it's not difficult, but it is extraordinarily time consuming. Yeah. And so we, we tend to give the chops a lot of lip because like, oh, he's in the rack or he's not qualified dive or yeah, whatever. Yeah. It's like, hey, that's that's a hard gig. Mm-hmm. And guess what? Um, being qualified dive doesn't matter in the supply world. Right. Right. Making sure that he can feed the crew does. Yeah. So – um, so we, we tend to give short shrift to the supply. It's exactly what you said until they can't produce the part we need. Mm-hmm. Everyone just assumes that it's going fine. Yeah. Um, now that said, you know, we're, you know, my personal opinion is that we're getting to a place where there's just not a lot of parts, right? Six True. eight eights are going yeah. away. So there's nothing on the shelf. Right. Virginia class, the way we purchased it, there's not a lot on the shelf. Mm-hmm. And so it kind of makes it seem like, uh, the supply world is just like, well, it's just there and yeah. the part will get here whenever it gets here and we'll deal with it. And so that tends to make people discount the importance of the supply world in the long run, yeah. in my personal opinion. That's just me. Yeah. It's always just been this point of uh, this like raw point, like this point of uh, it's it was it it's easy to spin <laughs> us up because like there's just a lot of things that and, and I, some of it is. I, I don't know. It's, I think it's just cultural in that it just seems like, like every supply officer I've ever had has been like slighted by the, you know, like, cause they come in as ensigns, but there are functionally department heads too. But like the, you know, Oh three, uh, JOs and department heads run them over. And then like, so they just, they're coming in into like an impossible situation where they're not qualified submarines and, um, they're effectively a divo, but somehow they're a department head too. And, and then they, because they're a supply officer and they're not nuclear trained, it just seems like they're just not in the cool kids club. Like, cause I've stood in the wardroom serving meals on my first boat where like, they just ate the guy's soul. And it was like, God, that sucks. Like I would never want to be the supply officer. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, part of that is it's the submarine culture, right? right? You know, the, the submarine force, what we value is what are you doing on the watch bill? Yeah. Yeah. And so you're like, until you're on a watch bill, people are like, okay, thanks for eating our food and breathing our air. And, <laughs> and that's just kind of the nature of our beast. Yeah. And I've, I've always seen the chops that always have the most respect are the ones that a, they give as good as they get. Yeah. Like okay, you want to you want to throw some my way? I'm gonna throw it right back right. at you. 
and also the ones that uh their standing dive or their standing uh you know contact coordinator yeah. or something where it's like hey you've got you know you've got your supply fish you know your your two fish fighting over a piece of seaweed <laughs> but uh but but you're doing submarine stuff right you know you're trying to be a part of the crew and what the boat does and are not just focused on your your specific submarine world and i think when 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 guys and gals tend to do that they tend to get a lot more respect out of the wardroom because True. it's just the nature of the beast i think for these small crews that are working extraordinarily long hours and uh and everyone just works super hard out there so they want to make sure that if the answer is always where's the chop oh they're in the rack well that's that's <laughs> gonna you know create anger <laughs> yeah well if you got good supply chiefs they're snatching them out of the rack anyway but um, hundred percent. Yeah. 100%. The, so the last, I mean, and, and if there's anything I missed that you want to talk about, we can hit at the end, but I just have this last question about, I just want to know if something's real or not. So I've been told, I've been told by a couple of different cobs that there's this like window at the end of a command tour of like three to six months where COs start to freak out because they can see the light at the end of the tunnel, but there's still time to get fired. <laughs> so he's like, hey, you'll see it with every CO, man, even if they're great, like you'll see them start to kind of white knuckle it for the last cut. Cause it's like, ah, what's something could still go horribly wrong or something like that. Is that, do you feel that? Cause I know, and I guess the broader question is like, what is that feeling of, being in command feel like like what is because it's got to be just an insane amount of pressure to you know like because you're you're that you're in charge of everything <laughs> and it's like you can't possibly control everything but you're accountable for all of it and so i've I, like i've read the i think it's the called the charge or the yeah the charge of command i think is what it's called um, yeah, charge of command. yeah so i've read that it's been a minute but like when you read it it's just like heavy like you're like holy jesus and and just to think about like i've seen s some co's at sea on deployment you know they're halfway through their command tour and it's just like you're just looking at them like the stress levels gotta be just bananas so i'm just curious like I, at the, the be i guess the best you can like just describe what that's like because i'm it's one of the qualifiers that i would always put on like i described my one of my co's to you as far as like him being uh, like kind of um you know he's tough to deal with he was kind of all over the place you never knew what you're gonna get uh just a roller coaster um you, like when you went to talk to he was one of those guys that was hard to bring bad news to because you never knew what you were going to get sometimes you'd bring something that you were sure he was going to just go through the roof and you would just be like okay and you're like huh <laughs> and then like other times you'd bring him something innocuous and he would lose his mind and so but i would tell people like look i get it that's not that was unprofessional that shouldn't have happened but think about what that guy like the pressure that guy's under. I can't even fathom it. And so I'd always qualify like my judgment of that interaction with good God, what pressure that man must be under. So I'm just curious, like as best you can, if you could describe it just to give people a little bit more like depth of understanding. It's uh, it, it's, uh, you know, you hate to say something trite, like it's impossible to describe. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I seem to recall uh, like my change of command speech mm -hmm. where I was like, it has been amazing and frustrating, yeah, exciting and disappointing. You know, like it's yeah. all the emotions all the time. Right. And, uh, you know, and, and it's funny because, you know, to address that the, the near the end of the tour thing, um, there are certain people that, you know, you can tell that, hey, I'm near the end. I just don't want to mess this up. Yeah. Um, I would say that 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 is real. It is not uniform. Okay. Um, and and I and I, you know, in I think it it stems from how you approach your command tour in general. Um, right. And this really kind of gets back to the the greater discussion of leadership. Of you know, I've when I was a when I was a young pup, uh, I always kind of said, yeah, you can't teach leadership, right? Like I was like, you can't pour leadership out of a cereal box. Right. You can't be like, okay, now you're a good leader. Yeah. Um, 
I've I have since matured and uh, and changed my opinion on that. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you still can't teach leadership. I think you have to. There has to be something in your soul that is comfortable being the guy in the spotlight. Mm-hmm. And if you're comfortable with that, then we can teach you to be better. Yeah. But if you're not inherently comfortable being the person under the heat lamp, um, then you're just going to survive. Yeah. Right. And uh, you're not going to thrive. And I and what I've seen and uh, is that if you're just trying to survive, then you you're keeping an eye on the end zone. Right. Um. I. I, I distinctly remember, you know, at the uh, after my change of command, you know, people were like, "Oh, did you feel like a huge weight came off your shoulders?" Yeah. And I was like, "No, I, I did not feel that way because I never felt that command was a burden." Right? Was it heavy? Yes, but it was a privilege to get to carry that weight. Right? Like okay. I worked really hard to get there, but here is. 150 to 170 depending on the underway people right that are looking at me and hoping that I'm going to take care of them the best I can and more importantly their parents yeah are looking at me hoping that I'm going to take care of their babies and so it's an immense weighty terrible and amazing privilege right to be in charge um, and it is frustrating, you know, when you when you come into the CEO state room and you bring him something and he loses his mind and you're like, I don't know what that was about. It wasn't about you. Yeah, yeah. It's the, he may have just gotten an email from his boss, you know, and but you came in at the wrong time. Right now, I tell you that I was always very cognizant of, hey, I have to respond the same way when people bring me news. Right. You know, hey, you just won the lottery fantastic what are we going to do about that yeah hey i just broke the reduction gears (laughs) fantastic what are we going to do about that right because people need to know how you're going to respond otherwise you get people walking on eggshells and they won't tell you things yeah so i was very i was very aware of how my interactions would drive further interactions right and and I I'd like to tell you that I never lost my mind, and that'd be a lie. Yeah. Um. But I can at least say that you know, having talked with my chiefs' quarters, you know, as as you near the end of the tour, and I was like, yeah, there's a couple of times that I you know I kind of lost my temper that I wish I hadn't. Um. But they they were always like, you know what? You never lost your temper. Where I was like. I don't understand why he's mad. Right. Like every time I lost my temper, they're like, I can see why that's, that's unacceptable. Yeah. So I, I can at least say that, but okay. um, it is, it is, it, there's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of expectations, both from above you, from below you and from you. Yeah. Right. Like you worked your whole career to get here and you want it to be this amazing thing. Yeah. And maybe it's not. Maybe sometime, maybe you took over a boat that was amazing and you just continue to elevate it. Maybe you were sent somewhere where it was, hey, you're here to fix it. Right. Because these guys are, they've had a rough road to hoe and you're here to try to help help them realize what they can be. Yeah. And sometimes, hey, all, we got average on everything. That's an above average performance, man. Congratulations. Yeah. But it doesn't feel like it because you were hoping you were gonna, you know, get the knock and right. you know, go go brief the president and you just didn't get it. Yeah. Um it's a, it is an amazing um like I said, it, you hate to say that it's trite and it's indescribable. Right. Um, but just being being the guy in charge that and you see it, people are just looking at you all the time. Mm-hmm. Um I remember having the uh you know, every, every squadron kind of does that like burger burn on the pier before you deploy, yeah. like the day of the deployment. And uh, and it's always super awkward. Like, here, here's your cold hamburger. Yeah. I'm going <laughs> to leave you for six months with your family. Um, but like, I remember standing out there with my wife and my wife's like, everywhere I look, somebody is looking at you. Yep. I'm like, yeah, I'm the captain. That's what they do. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's, you know, that's why, uh, that's kind of the genesis of that thought on test depth of, you know, leadership is theater at some point, right? Because right? they're always looking and everything yep. you do impacts 
what's happening on your ship. And so, yeah, it's a tremendous burden, um, but it's so rewarding too right. to see people grow and do things that they never thought that they could do. And and maybe I'm weird because, I mean, that's why I was going to be a teacher. Mm. Uh, I was going to be a band director and instead I'm doing this. But it's the same goal, which is I love to see people work hard and help them grow and see them do something that not even they thought they could do. Yeah. And then look at me like, holy crap, I just did that. I'm like, I know. And you're fucking awesome. <laughs> Yeah, it's right? like and the, uh and that's yeah. It's amazing. I yeah, I, it's the same thing um on a smaller scale. Like that's why I love being a chief so much. And then even like the I, what you described with the everybody's looking at you thing, I've I've noticed that it's the day like when I put on Master Chief and then like I I went down and did a waterfront training uh just filling in for the ISIC that they had something going on so they asked me to do it. And I'm like, "Yeah, sure." Last time I'd seen all these guys, I was a senior chief doing the same job at the same command. Like nothing has changed except now I'm wearing a master chief anchor. And uh, it was and my buddy tried to warn me. He was like, dude, it's just different. I don't know how to explain it, but it's it's just different. And I'm like, OK, so then I went down and did this training and it was, I was surprised they didn't throw freaking rose petals at my feet. I'm like, what are you doing? Like I, every one of you knows who I am. Like we've interacted before zero things have changed except apparently something did. And it was that weird feeling like, like you're like, everybody was watching me. It was really strange. And like the interactions were slightly different. Everybody was calling me master chief. And I'm like, calm down, like relax. Like uh, a lot of these people are my peers and it's just like, it, but there is something about that promotion that it just, people start treating you differently and it's not like, yeah, it's yeah. a, it, it's a thing. Yeah. Very, very bizarre. <laughs> like it was just existing relationships changed. Like the interactions that I have with people change. Um, yeah, it's just odd. And so like, and it's not, I know it's not the That's, same as be like, I'm sh maybe as a cob, but like, um, I'm sure it's not the same in, in my current role, but like, I can imagine that feeling of like, it's kind of the same thing. Cobb walks into a room and it's like, everybody's, there's like a little pause every time. <laughs> and it's just like every, it's same thing with the captain, except probably bigger. It's just like captain walks in, everybody stops what they're doing and is like, ah, oh, the captain's here. You know what I mean? Like, and it's, even if they're cool and oh, you yeah, know, it's, it's going to uh, be a normal interaction. Yeah, I, I always say everything is perfect within six feet of the captain. Yep, yep. <laughs> right? Like every everywhere I go, people have both feet on the floor. They're sitting up yep. right. There's a whole bunch of report request recommend going on. Yep. Uh, you know, so so it it makes it tough to like what's really going on. You know, right. Unfortunately for my guys, I I move really quietly, so I can uh, appear yeah. in spaces and see what's going on. But. Uh, no, it's a thing. I, that's why you know I talk with folks a lot of times about people like, how did you not know that that was going on on your ship? I'm like, no one, no one tells the captain things. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, think, think about when you were in boot camp. You know, the chiefs were God. Yeah. All right. So the captain is Zeus. Yeah. Right. Like to come on board, you know, you're you're on your first submarine, and here's an O five. Yeah. Jesus, right? Like, yeah. So they're not going to tell me things. They're going to tell their chief and their divo things. Right. And that's why the chief and the divo are so important to the running of the of the boat. Right. Like, you guys are the CEO of your division. You're going to know your people better than I ever will. Right. Because they're not used to seeing somebody of my level. Yeah. So you're the ones who have to understand your guys, to know what they're doing, to know what their dreams and their problems are, and then convey those to me so that I can knock down doors because that's why I exist. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I say the same thing about the – because we're an inspection team. It's like when we come down to the boat, it's like everything is prepackaged for our viewing. Like I'm not seeing what they do when I'm not here. I'm seeing what they've – packaged for the SMI guys, you know, like, and so it's an, and they're usually exactly. it's doing, a snapshot. yeah, they're usually doing an horse at the same time. So even the, the whole boat is acting different, you know, it's not even just supply. Um, but yeah, exactly. God, that's a great line. Everything's perfect within six feet of the captain. I'm going to, I'm going to use that. Um, anything, anything else you want to hit? Like, is there any, uh, any like leadership topics that you feel like we haven't, touched that you might that you might want to 
hit on? I mean, I, I could I could go on for days, man, because um, <laughs> I love talking about it. Um, obviously, that's yeah. that's why I'm here, right? Uh, I I appreciate you reaching out, um, because because it is difficult. It's difficult for people to understand what why do the people at the top think the way they think? Um, yeah. So I'm 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 happy to try to provide some insight into that, but it's just it's just my insight, right? Um, there's a I could go on for, you know, a whole nother couple hours, but I would say, you know, for the folks, cause I, I know a lot of chiefs and chief selects and folks that are aspiring to be in the locker, um, listen to your podcast. Yeah. And, um, if there's, if there's anything that I would hope people would get from all of this is, a uh, kind of my, um, my top three things. And, uh, and the guys on my boat will tell you, I had it engraved on like a 30 pound steel plate that I used to like walk on the treadmill carrying nice in a backpack. <laughs> but, um, yeah, but, uh, my top three things were always number one is to lead is to serve nothing more and nothing less. Okay. Um, the second one was treat people greatly and they will prove themselves to be great. Okay. And then the third one was, a leader is best when no one knows that he is there. And at the end, when the aim is fulfilled, the team will look at each other and say, we did it ourselves. Yep. I like it. Well, who so are that's, my, that's my top three for, uh, yeah. the, for the, for the goat lockers out there. I like it. That's, that's outstanding. I'm, and I'm sure I'll take you up on the, your ability to, uh, talk for more hours. Cause you, you know, me, I mean, you've reviewed, <laughs> you've reviewed the podcast lengths and we talked a little bit about it. So dude, every, every single one of them was like three hours. A lot like, of, them, a lot time, of, bro. yeah, a <laughs> lot of them are. I, and, and like it, I guess like a, a knock on me going into this one is like, I thought, I should have done a little more research and pulled some people because I feel like there's a lot more that we could and I I think I probably would go through. Um, but I like I generally do a lot off the top of my head and I feel like I probably could have got a little like I could have I could we could have went three hours if I was a, if I had done a little more research and prepared more questions. So I feel like I'll probably do that going into the next one. But I will 100 percent hit you up again. Um and yeah, I really I'm appreciate part you doing two, this. And hey, this is like an, yeah, this is an hour and a half, right? It's a, it's a good, yep. it's a D guts snack podcast. So <laughs> hardly, I just, sometimes I do like 20 minutes, 30 minutes when I do the spin the yarns, but yeah, no, I get a lot of grief about them being too long. So it's probably good to wrap up here. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, hey, thanks for, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. hundred percent. Thanks for, thanks for doing it. All right. I hope you all enjoyed that. Uh, I definitely did the, uh, he, it's just fun recording with him. Uh, and I'm very excited for the CS suggestion box series because it's, it's like I'm talking to a, uh, somebody that looks at the world uh, leadership development wise the same way I do. Uh, and it was, it was very fun to, to go through a lot of those topics. And even after we were done recording, I mean, we talked for almost another hour. So, uh, looking forward to following up, uh, even more with that. If you have any questions for me or you want to uh, get ahead of the curve and just submit questions for the CS Suggestion Box series or anything else, hit us up. Don't go up the podcast at gmail.com. You can Facebook message us. Don't go up the podcast or you can hit me up on Instagram or Reddit or Discord, whatever. However, <laughs> shoot up flares, smoke signals. Just get a hold of us. There's a ton of ways to do it. Uh, and we'll do everything we can to help you out with that or include your questions on the podcast. Uh, and then I mentioned the D gets apparel stuff. So if you want to help us out, so there's a donate button on the website that specifically nonprofit supports podcast expenses. That's it. it just helps us pay all the bills related to the podcast. But if, uh, you want to support the business side of the house, go check out D It's a uh, pride and heritage gear. You'll actually want to wear in public excited to get that rolling. Um, there's definitely been a positive response and I, I can't wait to see where it goes, but it's also Christmas time. So if you want to get something for your favorite veteran or active duty service member, uh, go check it out. The discount code for 15% off on everything on the website is Xmas 15. It'll be in the show notes as well. It's the letter X M A S all one word. And then 15 for 15% off on 
anything, your whole order or whatever's on the website. It applies to everything. So, uh, I encourage you to go take advantage of that until Christmas day when it expires. Um, and then, yeah, like go check out the YouTube channel. So it's just, it's literally youtube.com slash don't give up shit podcast. Uh, getting that spun up. It's all audiograms right now. It'll, it'll eventually turn into live video, like not live, but I'll go live sometimes, but like, like video podcasts of us actually recording, uh, some more like educational style ones and stuff like that. Uh, you'll see start to come out on the channel, but if you could go like share and subscribe and review on all the platforms for all the things and subscribe on YouTube and follow us there. Uh, I would really appreciate it. It helps get the word out to all the people uh, that need the resource. And that's it. That's what I got for you today. Thank you so much for listening. And don't give up the ship.